Oxford scheme, which has been shown in this session before. We also tried to calculate effect sizes uh, for the treatment modalities found, and this is the list for the treatment modalities found for the management of knee osteoarthritis, the respective effect sizes calculated, and the strength of recommendations for the therapeutic intervention according to the Oxford scheme. Toxicity was evaluated by the members of the panel according to a VAS, and you see the red bar here indicates the estimated toxicity for NSAIDs in the uh, management of osteoarthritis of the knee joint. So we finally ended up 2003 with the updated Euler recommendations for the management of knee osteoarthritis, and I tried to highlight it those dealing with possible structure modifying uh, therapeutic capacity. This is mostly related to the slow acting symptomatic drugs in osteoarthritis, which are mentioned within two of those recommendations. We also formulated some, exp some research agenda, also dealing with issues of structural modifications and the critical issue when to uh, perform joint replacement in those patients. It was just the same procedure for hip osteoarthritis, but the treatment modalities were very highly predominated by surgical ones including total hip joint replacement and osteotomy, and a smaller evidence for all the other therapeutic interventions, as you can see here. So in fact, there are only two differences regarding the uh, recommendations for the management of hip and knee osteoarthritis. Recommendation number five, dealing with the topical application of non-steroidals, is recommended only on the knee level, while uh, regarding the hip, a second, so to say, surgical recommendation has been included, uh, including osteotomy and other joint preserving surgical procedures. And it was a difficult task to uh, elaborate uh, recommendations for hand osteoarthritis, as the evidence for hand osteoarthritis is very small, which is indicated by the number of publications which is uh, listed on the y-axis here uh, regarding the treatment of hand OA uh, with respect to randomized control trials or even control trials. So therefore, we decided to uh, invent another system to determine the strength of recommendation by the expert's opinion as indicated by a VES scale and the five-point rating scale. And what you can see here is the uh, compiled agreement of the panel with the elaborated recommendation. And you see here a very high uh, percentage of agreement with this very common recommendation that management of hand osteoarthritis requires a combination of pharmacological and non-pharmacological measures. Why, uh, for example, for ultrasound as a therapeutic measure for hand osteoarthritis, there's almost no very high degree agreement of the panel for this recommendation. And these are the other recommendations, and you see here there are surgical recommendations also included, as well as uh, recommendations regarding uh, the Susadua group. And just to be very recent, in September, the task force published evidence-based recommendations for the diagnosis of NEOA in the EULA journal, The Annals of Rheumatic Diseases, and this is the diagnostic letter. Uh, the combination of all those symptoms gives you a 100% probability that the patient is suffering from knee osteoarthritis. So, Summing up this Euler recommendation, it was, a, it was possible to create a continent-wide consensus, but the evidence was primarily only available for NEOA. Uh, for HIPOA, most frequently the evidence was available in combination with NEOA, and HANDOA at that time seemed to be a forgotten disease as measured by the literature evidence. So we think that the strength of the Euler recommendations 
are their rigor of development, their scope and their clarity. Uh, there are some weaknesses, obviously. Uh, we are lacking stakeholder involvement in those recommendations. Uh, there is a question of applicability uh, and the editorial independence, but the principal strength could be the attempt to fill the gap between guidelines based only on research evidence or experts opinion as we try to combine both in elaborating those recommendations. There are obviously ACR guidelines for the management of osteoarthritis and the uh, way the ACR elaborates their guidelines is a bit different to the uh, ULAR situation. There is a group of rheumatologists which grades the, uh, the evidence and produces a paper which is then sent for external review in contrast to the procedure I showed you before. However, the outcome is very similar. As you can see here, there are no very, not very much differences between the ACR recommendations for the management of lower limb osteoarthritis and the EULA recommendations, except the devices, the assistive devices for daily living are not discussed in the EULA recommendations, and uh, also hot on ice packs are not discussed in the EULA recommendations, while acupuncture is not mentioned in both, as well as all the other measures. So in comparison to the most recently elaborated ORC guidelines, uh, ORC tried to be very comprehensive in their guidelines and list all uh, the treatment modalities, while EULAR per se is, uh, uh, is happy to uh, reduce the, the number of recommendations elaborated to a reasonable one. Uh, the ORC guidelines are developed by a more multidisciplinary uh, panel, while in the ULAR panel, the rheumatologists obviously form the majority. But in fact, uh, there is not so much difference between the guidelines in general, especially number one is, is the same. It is, it's no wonder as the uh, uh, first author of this paper is also the first author of the paper for the EULA guidelines. And within the URC guidelines, uh, number 19 deals with possible structure modifying uh, effects in, patient, uh, in patients with osteoarthritis of the knee, uh, recommending glucosamine and chondroitin on the knee level and diacerin on the hip level. And I'll show you afterwards some evidence uh, which may be the basis for this recommendation. Because in osteoarthritis, uh, there is a question what to treat. Uh, the best thing would be to have a, a combination between clinical efficacy and also structural efficacy. That's the least uh, desirable situation. And that's the situation we obviously have sometimes nowadays, that we have some structural efficacy without clinical efficacy or clinical efficacy regarding NSAIDs, uh, for example, without uh, structural efficacy. So in 2006, Jean-Pierre Pieletté published a nice paper dealing with possibilities uh, to uh, reduce progression of structural change in osteoarthritis, including non-pharmacological measures like this one, and also pharmacological possibilities like the inhibition of metalloproteases, like the application of nutraceuticals like intraarticular interventions, including viscous supplementation. So the target is at one time the inflammatory process is cartilage degradation, but also subchondral bone. And the examples targeting the process could, could be cytokines, it could be nitric oxide or oxygen radicals, it could be uh, inflammatory uh, uh, promoting substances like leukotrienes and prostaglandins, it could be metalloproteinases, it could be agrokinase, it could be the application of biphosphonates which was not really uh, successful for resedronate, or it could be, which is currently underway, to try to interfere with mechanism in the subchondral bone by, ap by applying strontium ranulate. So most recently, 
in February 2009, the stock trial with chondroitin sulfate was published and we were part of this trial with our department, as you can see here, uh, in also uh, with Franz Reiner in Graz. And uh, in this trial, including more than 600 patients, it could be shown, as before in the Zurich trial, which was published by Bert Michel, that uh, Jones space narrowing was less pronounced in the uh, chondroitin sulfate treated patients to a highly statistically significant amount in comparison to placebo and increasing over time. But in interestingly enough, this is mostly caused by the people with a high BMI. So the substance was not really effective in normally weighted people, but it was highly effective and more effective than in the, those people with this intermediate BMI to a European uh, point of view. Uh, but the m highest effectiveness was achieved in the people with the highest BMI. These data are relatively robust or more robust than other data as the radiological data were reblinded and were evaluated by two independent assessors uh, from Germany and from France, and this is the correlation coefficient for the uh, assessment of the two centers. So these radiological data are really robust and they relate <clears throat> in this group to a risk reduction of joint space narrowing of 33% uh, uh, indicating a number needed to treat of eight. And this is bought by a relatively safe therapy as it's important in osteoarthritis to have a favorable risk-benefit ratio for the patients as the disease per se is not really reducing uh, life expectancy. Some a little bit older data for glucosamine, very similar for the data uh, with chondroitin. But interestingly enough, in 2008, a survey in those patients revealed that the patients which had been treated with glucosamine for at least 12 months during those two trials by Karel Pavelka and Jean-Yves Reginster had a significant lower number of knee joint replacements necessary in the five-year follow-up. Regarding diacerin, was this the first substance uh, to show disease-modifying capacity on the hip joint level by the ECHO-DIA trial of Maxim Dugados, uh, published in 2001. And what you can see here in the ITT population, that diacerin, and that's the black line, uh, is favorable over placebo regarding uh, the narrowing of the joint space width uh, over the three years, uh, highly statistically significant. And also in this trial, a trend to a re reduction of the total hip joint replacements necessary in uh, the patients treated could be seen. These are the numerical data for the joint space width and calculating one could come up with a cartilage sparing effect of 32%. Safety and tolerability was reasonable with the most common side effect of diacerin. Uh, this is diarrhea, but also in this trial, a, f a reasonable uh, risk-benefit ratio could be revealed. And very recently, in fact, 10 days ago, this data were presented in Philadelphia for the soybean soaps, which are applied in osteoarthritis patients in France. And they also tried, Emmanuel Maheu tried to verify a disease-modifying capacity of this avocado soybean uh, soaps on the hip level. What you can see here is that the progressors were statistically significant, uh, the number of progressors was statistically significant lower in the uh, avocado soybean treated people, but regarding the number of the joint space with avocado soybean soaps were not more effective than placebo on the hip level. Metalloprotease inhibitors would be nice targets for structure-modifying therapy in osteoarthritis, but there are some, some problems with toxicity, 
just to be comprehensive enough some data about doxycycline which are very much similar to the other data and some data regarding a leukotriene inhibitor and a prostaglandin a combined leukotriene and prostaglandin inhibitor namely leukophelon which produced in comparison to naproxen statistically significant better results regarding structure modifications uh, including x-ray techniques and MRI cartilage volume measurement. So uh, regarding structure modification there is some way or let's say it's a long way to go uh, to uh, come to the last uh, objective for the management of NEOA. Uh, we should educate the patients about the way and its management. Obviously we should reduce pain which we are uh, in most cases capable of. We should improve function by reducing pain but we should, uh, we should enhance our activities to retard the progression of the disease. Thank you very much.